of times when we It's like, man, what's going to give, Lord? Like, obviously, I've got to work. I've, I've got to, um, to earn an income, you know, provide for my family, to be able to, 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 be able to pay my tithes and just, um, you know, do what I need to do as a husband and as a provider and, and as, a, as a father. But it's difficult out there. It's difficult anywhere, you know. And as I'm looking at this pit, you know, God continued to remind me that, that we're not to fall into that pit of despair. So easily it is to be to be entangled in that snare, right? Kind of, to kind of be entrapped. And and as I was thinking about that, you know, God kind of revealed to me that it's like Jesus, right? Jesus knew what it was to be in the flesh here on earth. He knew what it is to struggle, right, in the flesh. And I'm thinking about the time when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and and you talk about pressure. Right? You talk about feeling the stress. Right? Luke 22, Luke 22, 39. And I'll, I'll read this. Then accompanied by the disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room and went, as usual, to the Mount of Olives. There he told them, pray that you will not give in to temptation. He walked away about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed. How many of you know that we can't do anything without praying first, right? How many of you have ever heard that? Like, oh, man, I'm going to pray about it with you, or I'm going to pray for you, or what we need to do is battle it in prayer. And that's a lot easier said than done. I don't know about you, but, but you know, sometimes, sometimes, again, just being honest, prayer is the last thing I want to hear, or I want to hear people tell me, not because I'm not spiritual, but because, like, you don't understand, my lights are about to get cut off. You know, I need I need a hundred dollars right now. Father, if you're willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. And that's really what it boils down to, right? God's will be done, not my will. I've got to do my part. We all have to do our part. But ultimately, I want God's will to be done in my life. And Lord, if it is for me to struggle, then let me struggle with a smile on my face. You know, if I'm to be persecuted, then let me be persecuted with a smile on my face. If I'm to have a hard time, let me have a hard time with what? Smile on my face. And they say these things again because... You know, with everything going on with the resurgence of COVID and, and all that's happening in the world now, we've been shorthanded at work. So, so we usually, well, here lately, we've been running about a 12-man crew, and we got cut down to six. I'm one of two, two supervisors that helps run, run the crews there at work. So guess, one supervisor was out, guess who was left? Me. And I was feeling the pressure, I won't lie. I was feeling the pressure because the particular craft I was working isn't my normal trade. I'm running with a group of guys that aren't my normal crew, and everybody wants to tell me how to do the job but don't want to do the job, right? Anyone ever experienced that? You know? <laughs> so it's like, what do you want me to do? I've got the boss breathing down my neck. So talk about uh, maybe not so much persecution, but, you know, just the pressure of, of like, man, what am I going to do, Lord? Like, I'm, I need your help. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And what do you do? You know, you go complain about, about the boss to the boss. I mean, what, what are you going to do? Yeah. Right? Just, just keep, on, keep on working with a smile on my face. Yeah. Let, let, me, let me go home and, and tell my wife about it, right? <laughs> let me complain to her. But I was feeling the pressure. I was feeling the pressure on top of everything else, the pressure from work, you know, the, the financial pressures of, of the home, um, the pressures of the job, because, again, just being real, you know, the job was at the point to where the boss literally was saying, 
I don't know what we're going to do next week. If we're even going to have a job, in a sense, I literally worked myself out of a job. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, right? But I've worked myself out of a job. We're actually kind of in that same predicament this coming week. But, you know, I've learned these past several weeks not to, not to fret, not to worry about it, because I know God will provide. Amen? Amen. God will provide. I was telling the, the, the men, I was going to say the crew, but I was telling the men last night about that, about, you know, God's given me the opportunity to go and work at, at different, different plants, different locations. Um, the boss actually wants me to come off the books to, uh, to help ease the budget a little bit and has given me the opportunity to go work at, at a few different plants just for a few weeks here and there. Uh, one, it helps him out and helps me out because it gives me the overtime, right? But then takes me off the books over there. But it helps alleviate the pressure a little bit. But again, it goes back, I'm going back to Jesus here. And, and as he's praying in the garden, he's feeling that pressure. He says, Father, if you're a willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. He prayed more fervently, and he was in such agony of spirit that sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. At last he stood up again and returned to the disciples, only find them, to find them asleep, exhausted from grief. Asleep, exhausted from grief. How many of you have been so just drained, right? So just worn out that you're just tired. You're just tired, right? And I've, I've been there. I know we've all been there. Like, Lord, I can't continue. I'm tired. I'm tired of struggling. I'm tired of, of all the pressures of life. I'm just tired. I'm tired of not catching a break. I'm tired of taking, what do we say, one step forward and two steps back. Something's got to give, right? And I'm thankful. I'm thankful that, that God always makes a way. Again, kind of like that song, right, the reckless love of God. Like, he continues to chase, even when I feel like giving up. Even when I feel like giving up, God says, no, no, son, I got you. Right? I got you. I'll never forget, my wife and I had just recently, I say recently, we had just been married and had been married maybe right at a year, maybe maybe two years. And we're living in, right there in old Gretna. And we're renting a house from one of our, our um, church members at the place we were at before. And... I came home from work, and there's a pink tag hanging on my front door. A pink tag. I'm like, what is this about? So I go to pull it off the door, and I'm looking at it. It says, lights will be disconnected at 4 p.m. today. Yeah, nothing in that pocket. And nothing in this pocket. I don't know how I'm going to pay this bill. $99 of what my light bill was. So I called Eleanor and I told her about it and she had said that she had gotten a call from the energy company and said that the bill was past due and that we owed $100, you know, $99. And if we weren't able to pay today, that lights would be disconnected. So I started looking for candles because I didn't have the money to pay the bill. Just being true, being honest, right? And would you know, one of the elders of the church had gone to, to my wife's office just to say hello as she did often, and gave my wife a hug. And when she did that, she said, I don't know why, but God told me to come up here and to see you. And she gave her a Pentecostal handshake. And for those that don't know, it's kind of that, that little pocket you make right here, you know, where you got, got the money tucked away so other people can't see, and like, hey, how you doing? You know, this is for you, without saying, hey, how you doing? This is for you, right? Pentecostal handshake, they call it. But, you know, that was a $100 bill that she had given my wife without knowing that we needed lights to be paid that day by 4 o'clock. And if I remember the story correctly, this happened right about 3 o'clock, 3.15 in the afternoon. Just enough time for my wife to take off of work early to head to the, to the place to make the payment so lights wouldn't be cut off. Look at how perfect God is. Not only did he provide for the bill, but he provided that little extra, amen? 
and I'm thankful for that. God, God never ceases to amaze me, amen? Even, even being stressed at work, God never ceases to, to amaze me because being in, in, being in leadership, being in, in, in a position of, of authority, if you will, even all the pressures that I'm facing, I know the guys are facing the same pressures. I hear the stories. I know what their home life, well, most of their home lives are like. I know their struggles. I know what they deal with. One of our guys just lost his mother to, to cancer. One of our guys is dealing with the pressure of whether or not to take the COVID shot from his own family. His family's pressuring him. Some of those guys are struggling with, how am I going to get to work because my vehicle is broken? And, you know, God cares about all of these matters. And he cares about all of our matters, too. Everything that weighs heavy on our hearts, everything that we think about, everything that, I don't know about you, but I know me, sometimes I think, man, Lord, I hate to bother you because I know you're busy. But those things are important to God as well, amen? Those things are important to God. I'm sorry, I lost my spot here. Those things are important to God, and I'm thankful. I'm thankful that God cares about me. I'm thankful that he's concerned with the things that I'm concerned about. I'm thankful that he loves me enough to be concerned, amen? Now, there's a, there's a cost, though, right? There's a cost. I have to wake up. I wake up 2.30 in the morning to get ready for work, to go to work. 2.30 in the morning. I have to leave the house by 3, 3.15 at the latest. That's a cost of going to work, the cost of making a check, right? There's a cost for, for wanting to, uh, to, to get a little more experience and, and, and taking night classes. There's a cost. I'm away from my family. I'm away from my church family. You know, that, that comes at a, at a cost. I'm away from my wife who, who misses me dearly. That's a cost, a short-term cost, right? And there's a cost of following Jesus, there's a cost to following Jesus. As they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. But Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in and birds have nests. But the son of man has no place even to lay his head. He said to another person, come, follow me. The man agreed, but he said, Lord, First, let me return home and bury my father. But Jesus told him, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. There's a cost of following Jesus. Sometimes it's real easy to pay that cost, right? No. <laughs> Any cost is a cost. It's not always easy. It's difficult to follow Jesus. You know? I shared... I shared, um, when I first started doing men's ministry here, I shared about the pressures of, uh, again, I, I relate this back to work, but the pressures of being at work and, and being a godly man at work. And not that I'm ashamed of the gospel, but it makes it real difficult when people know that you're different. You know, we can be buddy-buddy. Gary, come on up here, bud. We can be buddy-buddy, and we can say, hey, man, how you doing today? Good to see you, you know? You doing all right? Turn around for the camera. This is my buddy Gary. And, you know, we've been friends for, for a while now, right? And he knows that I'm a great guy at work. And he knows that I work hard and I show up to work every day. And he does the same. What he doesn't know is that I love Jesus. What he doesn't know is that I don't tell the dirty jokes that the other guys tell. What he doesn't know is that I don't laugh at the jokes that they tell or, or um, share in the gawking of the women at work or whatever the case might be, right? I don't do that, but the other crew does. The rest of the crew does. So when Gary here finds out that I'm a lover of Jesus, guess what happens? Gary, where are you at? Gary. Gary. Where where did you go? 
right? And that's the cost I have to pay because once people find out that I love Jesus, oh, no, brother, you got to go. I'm going to go have lunch with, with the other crew, and you're going to be over here by yourself. And I'm cool with that. But that's a cost I have to, I have to pay, right? Because I choose not to indulge in, in those other activities. Thank you, brother. I choose to be different. I choose to accept that cost of loving Jesus, right? Everything comes as a cost. And sometimes, sometimes that cost is going to cost you a lot, a whole lot. It could cost you a job. It can cost you money. It can cost you friends. It can cost you family. Right? But... <laughs> But that cost is so worth it. It's worth it to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen? Amen. There's a cost. That pit, that pit we talked about earlier, there's a cost. We can choose to, to be and to look at that pit, that pit of despair, that pit of hopelessness. Right? We can choose to reflect on that and think, woe is me, and feel sorry for myself. Right? But what's, again, what, what does that cost? You know, for me to have, to have a bad attitude at work, for me to have a bad attitude towards my spouse or towards my friends or towards my coworkers, you know, for me to have a bad attitude about myself and, oh, man, here we go again. I got to go back to work. Right? Or we can look at the other side and say, you know what? <laughs> I know that that's not deep. I know that that's just temporary. Once that, once that water dries up, that puddle no longer looks like a pit, right? But I know that underneath there is a solid foundation. It's a solid concrete foundation that I can stand on and I can have hope in and that I can rely on. And for those that are watching online, you know, we can have hope, and we can rely on Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? For those that are here, we can rely on Jesus for everything, no matter what our struggles are, you know? Again, we go back to that song, man, what a perfect song for them to play this evening, right? That God loves you so much that he's going to chase after you, right? He's going to conquer that mountain. He's going to kick down that door. He's going to find you wherever you are so that he can embrace you. And he can love you because you're worthy. Even when you think you're not, you're worthy. Amen? You're worthy. Man, I'm just thankful. You know, it wasn't long ago that, let me see, we're going 16, 16 years. 16 years, so it'll be... Is it 16 or 17? Anyway, I'll have to do a quick math, but it's been 16, 17 years that I've been serving God wholeheartedly. And I like to tell people all the time that I've been saved since birth because my mom had served in church. And every time the doors were open, I mean, literally, I'm in church day in and day out. I can remember tent revivals, and I can remember on a Sunday night, you know, thinking, how am I going to get enough sleep for school because I'm at church 11 o'clock at night. And that's just the praise and worship. We haven't even started at church yet. Man, I'm going to be hurting in the morning, right? But I'm thankful. 16, 16 years. I'll just say 16 years. 16 years I've been serving God faithfully. Prior to that, you know, God was only fire insurance for me. That was it. He was fire insurance. Oh, man, you love Jesus? Yes, I love Jesus because I don't want to go to hell. But I'm not living that lifestyle, you know? I'm faking the funk. And that's not what God wants. I had gotten hurt at work. I used to work here at the shipyard, uh, here at the local shipyard in Avondale. And I had gotten hurt, and I had, had broken my ankle, didn't know it, went and played the full soccer game, um, walked on it, ran on it, everything. I said, man, it still doesn't feel right. You know, went to the doctor, and he's like, oh, yeah, it's broken. 
in the walking cast two and a half years. And I thank God for, for a full recovery. It could have been a lot worse than what it was. But during that time, you know, God had gotten a hold of me and he had arrested me because I needed my heart changed. I needed it changed, you know. I remember, I remember crying out to God, man, Lord, make me different. I had the opportunity to take some youth up to a summer camp. And as I was there, I was told I could stay and work as a counselor. And here I'm thinking in my mind, you don't even know me, but okay. I mean, if that's what you need, you know, that's what the church needs. And I'm willing to help. You know, I'm, I'm not that kind of guy. Don't get me wrong. But I love Jesus. You know, because my life had been changed. And as I'm there the first night, the, the speaker had, had gone on stage. And I remember he had emptied out the sleeping bag. And he had rolled it out. And as he rolled it out, he started to pull things out of the bag. And he holds up a picture. And it's a picture of a young man. And at this time, he's talking to all of the young people that are in the crowd. And he says, what are you sleeping with? What are you sleeping with? And in this case, it was reference to whether it was a boyfriend. He holds up a, young, a picture of a, a young girl and whether it was a, a girlfriend or whether it was alcohol or whether it was drugs or whether it was sex or whether it was whatever else you, you want to put in that blank. What are you sleeping with, right? And as he says that, I could feel God grabbing a hold of me and shaking me and like, what are you holding on to? And the image that I was given was like a storage locker, right? You put stuff in the storage locker, and you close the door, and you put a lock on it, and, and whatever you have in there, it's safe, it's secured, and, and those are the things that you want to hold on to, right? But God says, no, that's not necessary. Those things that you're holding on to, those are the same things that God wants to free you from. And we continue to hold on to those things. We continue to do our everyday activities and um, let me grab a chair. Oh, Brother Gary, would you mind grabbing me a chair? Sorry to keep calling you right there in the front. But, you know, what, what are we holding on to? What are the things that are controlling our life, right? Thank you, brother. So imagine if I've got to do everything with this chair, you know, if I, I've got to carry it everywhere I go. You know, at first it's not, it's not heavy, and, and you can kind of manage it a little bit, right? But imagine if you had to do this day in and day out. It wouldn't be very comfortable to sleep with, right? It wouldn't be very comfortable to have to shower with. Could you imagine getting your vehicle while holding this chair? How difficult would that be, right? You had to eat. You had to sleep. You had to work. You had to do all your daily activities with this chair. After a while, it begins to take its toll on you, right? And it gets heavy. And it becomes burdensome. And that's not what God has for you. That's not what God has for me. He wants to free you from that, right? He doesn't want us to have to carry those things. And as I'm listening to the speaker that night, you know, God had gotten a hold of me and he had changed me. And from that night forward, I was like, all right, Lord, I'm serving you wholeheartedly. What was the next move? You know, that's what I went home and asked the pastor. Well, what's the next move? What do I do next? I don't know. You know, but I know I couldn't keep doing the same thing over and over again, right? I was going to be crazy, right? We just talked about that last night, the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again but expecting different results. And that's where a lot of us are at, right? We expect change and we expect things to happen, but we're doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. And that's not going to happen until the one that's able to breaks it. And changes it. As God changed me, you know, I, I started, I started to, to act different and talk different and see different. Visions and dreams. A new hope. I could start to see on the horizon. I could see the finish line. Right? Because it was different. And I'm thankful for that. 16 years later. 16 years free of drinking alcohol. Free of chasing women. Hopping bar to bar. Just a small, small portion of my testimony. 
right? My mother had me out of the wedlock. I was a preemie. Mom had me out of the wedlock. She didn't want me. She didn't want me because it was going to be difficult because she was worried about what her church family was going to say, only to find out that the church family actually embraced her and encouraged her to have me. The same week she was going to the abortion clinic, her best friend said, no, let's go to church instead. And here I stand, 43 years old. Praise God, you know, praise God. I'm thankful. I'm thankful for a mom that brought me up in church. You know, for those that, that brought children to church this evening, don't be discouraged. You know, they may, they may run around and, and play, and, and you may think that they're not listening. But it's okay if they've got a coloring sheet or they've got a tablet or whatever because they're getting that word. They're getting that word subconsciously, consciously. You know, you may not think of it, but they'll surprise you. They'll surprise you. They're getting that word. But I'm thankful for a mom that raised me in church. Thankful for a dad that encouraged me to go to church. I'm thankful for parents that love me, that love Jesus. Man, man, I can't, I just, I, I can't thank him enough. I'm just thankful. Amen. My biological father, I was able to reach out to. Still a work in progress. <laughs> but I reached out, you know. I reached out. And that's what God wants to do tonight. He wants to reach out. And he wants to say, son, daughter, it doesn't matter your situation. Whatever you've been through, whatever you're going through, whatever's on the horizon, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. The word tells us that what? His burden is light, right? Is that right? I'm sorry, I just lost the train of thought, right? But the yoke that, that we carry, he can remove that. We no longer have to carry that. We can give that to God, amen? And I'm thankful for that. Let's stand to our feet. I'm thankful. Amen. Amen. Here in a little bit, we're going to put some worship music on. We're going to open these altars just for you to be able to spend some time with the Lord one-on-one. -on -one. Man, I'm thankful. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this evening, Lord. We thank you for, for the word that's gone forth, Lord. We thank you for just this opportunity, Lord, to, to love you, to worship you, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for just making it easy for us to realize that no matter what we're going through, no matter, no matter what we're struggling with, Lord, that you are there for us. All we have to do is call on your name. Thank you, Father, for carrying our burdens. We cast our cares upon you, Father. Thank you for chasing us. Thank you for choosing us. Thank you for loving us, Father. We just thank you, Father. We pray this evening as we go forward, Lord, that you just be with us. You watch us. You protect us. You cover us, Father. You go before us, Father, that you align us, Father, with divine appointments, Lord. We pray that your perfect will be done in each and every one of our lives, Father, that you give us the opportunity to share the gospel, Lord, to share about your love, to give hope, Father. We just thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Again, these altars will be open. We'll get some music going if you want to spend just a few minutes here with the Lord. Be encouraged. Be strengthened. Amen. Have a good evening. We love you all.